coming to the fifth and final um, Artist in Residence Search candidate. Today we welcome Katie Martin. Katie is a choreographer, performer, teacher, and recipient of the National Jacob K. Javits Fellowship in Dance. Many of you have known her over the past semester as our lead replacement for Penny Campbell, where she's been teaching movement intentionality and 260, which is advanced beginning dance. Um, she has presented and performed her choreographic work throughout New York City and nationally, including the Joy Soho, Dance Theater Workshop, which is now New York Live Arts, and Dance Space Project at St. Mark's. Originally from Hilton Head, South Carolina, where she trained and performed for 10 years under the office of the American Valley Theater as a principal ballerina, um, theater principal ballerina Karen Brock Carlisle. Katie went on to receive a BA with a concentration in dance at Bennington College and, follow, and followed up with her MFA in dance at Smith College. We are so happy to have her here today. Please help me in welcoming Katie Martin. Thank you. as a choreographer and performer and some of the things that inspired me along the way. Um, I was here last year around this time talking about my work, but more from an interdisciplinary angle, so I won't go into all that stuff this time. I want to look more at the videos um, and talk about some of the, the processes that I use, um, and then show you a little solo about halfway through. Um, so I want to start at the point where I went off to college, because that's mainly where um, most of my choreographic work got started. Um, I ended up, basically, as Crystal mentioned, I spent a lot of time um, in the ballet world initially before I went to college. Um, and eventually, I, I wanted to kind of think more expansively and, and work more experimentally with my movement vocabulary that I was um, becoming fluent in. And so I decided to attend Ben College um, because I was looking for a place where choreography and creative process were just as much emphasized as, say, the, the technical performative aspect. Um, so my particular dance training at Bennington was um, with dancers primarily who were from the Trisha Brown Dance Company. So at that time, there was a whole contingent of um, department artists coming through, and most of them coincidentally were not happy from Trisha Brown. So that was my particular history. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just name a couple. So Eva Kurtzog, who was an early um, dancer with Trisha Brown in the late 70s or the 80s. Um, Kate Thompson worked with her, I believe, most of the 90s, about 10 years. Um, Lisa Krauss, Vicki Schick, they were both early 80s. And then Gwen Welliver, who worked as the rehearsal director um, with her in the 2000s. So that style for me really was imprinted. Early on as a performer and, and kind of really informed my creative process along the way. Um, and so I want to pull up some clips of her work just so you can get a sense of people who do them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about kind of her trajectory as an artist because it shifted kind of radically. Um, I'm going to keep the sound off so just uh, let me kind of see the work go. The sound, and these are all like compilation videos anyway, so it shows up. So, um, Trisha Brown came to New York in the early 60s and she um, got with a group of artists called the Jazz and Dance Theater. Um, and a lot of the work that they were doing was kind of upending the traditional viewing experience of dance. So, when you think about what your role is as a viewer watching dance, it's usually you're sitting in a theater. Um, a lot of the movement that you're seeing is stuff that you can't do, usually, as a human being. <laughs> And music is usually involved in some way, or it's aligning with the movement, um, usually in some way. Um, and so none of this was happening with the Judson artists. So they were um, working in warehouses and outside and in people's lofts and um, using kind of task based um, apparatuses and structuring principles to make work. Um, a lot of it was collaborative. Um, usually there was no music or it was environmental sounds. Um, so Trisha's contributions were, were a lot um, in, in terms of using equipment and, and kind of structuring props um, to play with the physics of the body. So um, she was really kind of playing with gravity and momentum um, and 
velocity, but really kind of refined and simple structures. So nothing um, complex rhythmically or dynamically. Um, and then she kind of dropped all this work pretty much in, I would say, the, the mid-70s. So she spent a good deal of time in this um, realm. But um, she really wanted to start more vigorously investigating the body, unencumbered from all this other crop um, material. And so um, she stuck with the idea of physics and motion, but she, she really wanted to play more dynamically and, and uh, deal with movement material in a more complex way. Um, and so yeah, you can see there that they're, they're just kind of playing with the experience of falling and how do you, how do you support someone in that process. Um, and so her first piece, kind of using this new shift in her creative approach, was Watermoon. So I will show a piece of that. And this is actually all in science anyway. And so right away, you can kind of see um, She's still playing with the physical capabilities of her body, but it's it's definitely um, more about the, the physical and sensorial experience of moving rather than having external um, structure and principles or tasks laid on um, to her movement. So you see the lines of organization, the gravity, the weight, kind of the torque and momentum. And um, I think this work really shows kind of the, the stream of consciousness um, mode of organizing movement. Um, so she was really, her process was really improvisational. So kind of working day to day with her, her personal experience sensorially of the body and creating using material that way. Um, and it was a tedious process for her of, of kind of backtracking and trying to remember those original connections. Um, but it was, this was the initial platform that she used to eventually teach her dancers. And so she's playing a lot with like impulses moving, whether uh, like recovering the logic of each impulse or reverting it to some other part of her body. So there's like this element of surprise and constantly shifting momentum. And she also played with transitions. So it wasn't just about the actual gesturing itself, but it was like when and where and how is it are all these movement moments happening. Um, and I want to quickly show a restaging of Waterloo because they have been wanting to do it for a really long time and they finally found a dancer that was willing to take on the task because it happened to be a piece that was really hard to recapture kind of the wildness and the rawness of her um, original movement connections. And so one of her longtime dancers, Neil Beasley, decided to take it on and in 2001, um, I just have a little clip here, and I think he does a pretty good job of um, articulating kind of the, the force and the speed and again kind of the, the wildness of it without losing the clarity of the form. And then this will eventually shift into some group work, and I'll just let it keep going. Um, so, Trisha Brown's movement material actually felt really intuitive to me personally when I started working with it. I was really interested in the multi-directionality of the, of the um, constantly shifting kind of sequencing of motion, um, the dynamic shifts, um, that anything could kind of be considered movement or a movement material for a dance that had kind of clarity of attention to it. Um, and so, I mean, obviously I've been influenced by other artists over the years. Um, I would say Doug Barone was a big influence for me. Um, Kathleen Hermesworth, who was out in San Francisco. Um, uh, some dancers from Bill P. Jones, so Paul Madison, Jen Egypt, but I feel like there's always a through line that I come back to with Trisha's work um, that really informs me as an artist. So I started to kind of integrate all these influences and um, make my own kind of personal Statement. So this was an older clip, 1980, a golden, and 
and then you're seeing just a real kind of play on um, kind of the pedestrian body. So there's this this uh, kind of curiosity that she had with natural movement, uh, pedestrian movement, but how do you really kind of make it uh, magical and, and mysterious, even though it's it's almost anyone could do it, but when you, when you multiply and amplify it in different ways and um, different combinations, it becomes hard to execute. So I'm going to kind of shift and show some solo work that I did. Um, so you can kind of get the sensibilities of, of all that information that I was gleaning over the years. So this first piece um, was made in 2008. Um, it's called Trace Mark. And it was a solo that I did Feldman score patterns on a chromatic scale. It was a 1981 piece that he made. And he was a pioneer in um, kind of the tra uh, chance operations, so indeterminate scoring systems and graphic notation systems. Um, and he was interested in exploring kind of extremes in duration. So this particular piece he made was 90 minutes long, but he's made pieces that are six plus hours long. Um, and so this was mainly done by him working with a play between combining constantly shifting polyrhythms and then stretching um, really imperceptibly slow shifts of time um, rhythmically. So he was creating both an abrupt and kind of subtle variations of sonic information. And I really wanted to play with kind of a parallel process of how do I embody that idea through movement. So um, taking movement material and constantly shifting it dynamically, and then also how do I kind of stretch time dynamically with the movement? So I'll show. Um, I'll kind of scroll through this. So. Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
So I didn't make a 90 minute piece, <laughs> but I made the first uh, basically 10 minutes of that, of that score. But that would be a good challenge, actually. We have been on a couple of minutes. Um, so the next piece that I want to show is actually what I think of as the companion piece to this, this trace mark. It's called Six Bagatelles. It was made in the same year, and it was also a solo that uh, I made for myself. And, um, I say companion piece in that it does kind of the opposite structurally as the Feldman works. So the Feldman was really busy and bold and kind of epic and sprawling in terms of the structure and the task that I had. And, um, the work that I used for this next piece, Six Bagatelles, was Anton Weber's Six Bagatelles for String Quartet. Um, and it was uh, about four minutes long and it was delineated by six kind of short musical statements about. 20 seconds to 90 seconds long each. Um, and so I felt my task was really about restraint and clarity and intention and precision and brevity. Um, he talks about his process as making a novel on a single uh, breath. And so I felt like that was kind of a, a great um, image to work with. Um, what else can I say about this? Um, so the, these statements, that he, these sonic statements that he made, that I feel like the form and the structure were immediately revealed, and so how do I um, immediately also show a kind of a really clear image? And it felt actually really filmic to me in terms of the process on the inside, um, because I felt like the passage of time is really important. How do I show different kinds of moments? And from the viewer's experience. What does it mean to show the beginning of the movement? What does it mean to show the movement that had already started and that the lights were coming up on? What does it mean to cut off um, an image that's slowly unfolding over time? So I was playing with kind of the perceptual um, aspect of the viewer as well. So I'll this whole thing. It's only five minutes.
So I'm going to shift gears and, and do a little dancing. Um, some of you might have seen the solo that I did last week for Andrea. Um, it's called Fields and Figures, and it was basically um, taking one of her chapters of her book, uh, Place of Dance, which was for me space and place, and specifically how um, space shapes, shapes the body and the body shapes space. Um, and so I felt like this was a real kind of complement to some of my current interests, which is um, how body movement and um, kind of the per perception of the etched sketch, drawn, painted, sculpted line, um, kind of intersect in a real attention to form. And so what happens when you just work with the bodies, the possibilities of body movement and the permutations of the structure of the body, um, what kind of meaning might be revealed? That's tension or relationship or metaphor or some other um, connection or feeling state that um, I will transition when she was off the fields and figures. And the sound is a field recording by Jake.
shift to um, some group work because I feel like that's a lot different at least <laughs> for me, just structurally and trying to find an approach that I really wanted. Um, I was really looking for a way to play with the unique physical dispositions of the dancers themselves and not just what I, what my sort of strengths are um, physically. Um, and so that took me a really long time to figure that out, actually. Um, it, it felt really tedious um, and kind of just challenging to find a way to build complexity with other people without telling them exactly how to do it. Um, and so I just want to show a couple of pieces that I feel like um, kind of play with that idea of complexity in um, structural, structural um, agendas. So this first piece that I want to show is called Percussion Suite and I made it in 2011. And it was inspired by three jazz greats. So Papa Joe Jones, Alvin Jones, and Walter Graves. And collectively, they, uh, their work traversed kind of the, the whole gamut of jazz from the early modern swing bebop era all the way to kind of the avant-garde, really free, um, expression of jazz. And I will play this and talk about it while it's going. Um, so each, there's three sections. Essentially this is the first section, and it's, it's this is Papa Joe Jones playing. And it's a solo for one of my dancers, Lisa and um, DeBasio. And we were playing with this idea of um, clarity of mind versus ambiguity of mind. So trying to find ways to make a playful statement that really paralleled the competition to really light, playful style of playing. Um, and then just kind of dealing with like how do you how do you show messiness <laughs> uh, gesturally and, and kind of line-wise in the body and playing with scale, so really, really small gestural information, which is larger kind of swimming motions. And I'm not going to show this whole piece, so, so that was kind of this first opener. Um, so the next piece comes right after that. This is Elvin Jones' work, and he um, was the drummer for John Coltrane at the height of John Coltrane's popularity. He was considered the world's greatest drummer in that um, he was really virtuosic rhythmically and dynamically. Um, he was really interested in polyrhythm and the spaces between polyrhythm. Um, and so I, I kind of took this idea and tried to find the spaces between his sonic material. So this is a, a group section. Let's see. And so we basically took two phrases of movement material and tried to counterpoint them in different ways. Um, and this is actually slightly improvised, so the dancers are trying to find ways to shift between the two phrases that they're each playing, or that they're, they're each dancing. And then hooking into wherever the rest of the people are that they're that they're in. So syncing up at that time. Um, so it becomes this kind of kaleidoscopic counterpoint. In terms of just like the visual spatial um, configurations that keep shifting. And then also rhythmically with what you're hearing. Double 
bit orbiting, less sparring, a little bit of sparring going on. section, um, which is another group section, and this was really about, um, his, his playing style was always at the edge of chaos, I felt like. It was really, really frenetic, he was an iconoclast, he worked a lot with Ned Tanaka, who was a good dancer, and so he had a huge following in Japan, actually, in the 70s. Um, and so for this piece, I was interested in how do I take simple rules and um, offer them to the dancers to interpret at will. So we took a phrase that I made and I showed them once and then they uh, made a variation based on their perceptual interpretation of it. And then we just played with it spatially and rhythmically and um, relationship-wise. And one of the challenges this particular process was that most of the dancers ended up being injured or sick for most of the process. And so um, a lot of this material, in terms of the, the subtle and the small parts, um, came out of those days when we were, they were all basically out of conditions just energetically and physically. Um, and I think that's a really just interesting thing to remember when you're working with other people. It's like, how do you still move forward? and um, get the best out of people from where they're at, um, and not just what you think their baseline capacity was when you first told them you know, that you want to work with them. Um, and so I feel like a lot of the, the really great moments in this are the, the more subtle, nuanced cases. And I don't think we would have gotten there if we didn't have that in a circumstance. going through this one. I'm going to move on to the last piece. So that was percussion spin. Um, the last piece I want to talk about is um, JD in Love, and that was made also in the same year. And the back story to this was that um, it was made in about two weeks with eight people, all grad students. And they were all pissed off because. <laughs> Um, it was kind of sprung on everybody. The faculty usually do a, a faculty concert at some point in the year, and this particular year there's so many guest artists that they didn't have one scheduled, and then they sprung, sprung it on everybody at the last moment. Um, and so I was representing Smith that year in the five colleges, and so they asked me to make this 
case and one of my students, and all of them were working on their theses and were super stressed out, and they had a concert in like a month. So I was like, how do I make this fun and get them to help me <laughs> basically do this without it being um, too painful? So um, I decided to work with a uh, Hip hop producer Jamie's Donuts, which was an album he made in 2006 that was made in the hospital. Actually, he was um, ill from an incurable blood disease and he actually died three days after the album was released. And so for me, um, I feel like his legacy as a, as a DJ artist and a beat producer was that he um, established the requirement basically for all DJs going forward that you can't make a beat unless it already had, you can't have a, a, a song um, without an emotional kind of component already built into the beat itself. So even without the lyrics, the beat making has to have some sort of emotional response to it. And um, all of his work eventually came, became songs for Common and um, Song Village. You know, other um, records, but um, I felt like this piece, this album that he made was a real um, kind of just final statement, obviously, and about love and nostalgia and memory and um, all the kind of ways that you can love somebody, be it familial or romantic, um, spiritual. Um, and so I felt like it was kind of a nice, it was towards Valentine's Day, and I thought it was just a nice kind of way to jump into a career. So, so I'll keep talking about it. So it's, it's an episodic dance. Um, it's about 12 different episodes, and they're all about a minute long. I won't show all of them. So this, this episode was just about you know, what happens when you meet, <laughs> meet somebody. And the song is called Hi. Kind of that first energy. And I think built into this whole piece is this idea of looping and repetition um, and how things can start, stop, retrace, and back up, and start again. And so we get right into the next episode. And this is called Last Donut of the Night. <laughs> and so it's just really about that feeling at the end of the night at a club, and I'm just waiting around. <laughs> and um, there's this like slow, syrupy kind of energy to it. Time. 
And you'll see that the, the dance is pretty raw. Like, they haven't rehearsed that much. And so that's kind of just another component. Like, how do you just trust the dancers that they're going to take it on, take the responsibilities of the work, and make it their own, and um, deal with the fact that there's something at, at stake creatively for them? And so I just want to say that it's, for me, it's not about going into the studio by myself and, and thinking about what kind of dance I want to do, but it's really like getting in with the dancers and kind of grappling with where they're at and um, trying to find ways to um, pull out their uniqueness. Um, and it's less of me kind of showing and doing and more of me trying to find the right forms and the right language to um, articulate the right kind of forms that fit in that particular situation. So um, I feel it's like it's much more of me being a catalyst and a sculptor rather than anything else. So I will wrap that up there. Any questions? Thanks for your time. And I, that's crazy to put on that because that actually was a departure from where I usually work. And I don't work so much from um, like a template of like a narrative. Like it felt like there was a lot there that was already in the music that I was just trying to pull out dynamically with the relationships that were unfolding. Um, but no, that's that's usually um, not the way I work. I usually just have a kind of loose um, running. Uh, palette of different you know, sonic ideas that I'm interested in. Um, and I don't choose the sound usually until about halfway through. So um, usually we, in the beginning of our process, I, I just get into the studio and, and kind of do a lot of like watching them solo and seeing what their material is and getting them to kind of interact in different ways. Um, and then that, that just gives me more information to, to then structure yeah, it's all contingent upon like who I'm working with, basically, and that shifts all the time. Okay, 
think you're really um, knowledgeable about a really diverse range of music and music history. It's, where did that interest come from? Um, well, um, I have a lot of friends who are DJ artists, <laughs> and so I'm usually not the one finding this stuff. They're usually giving it to me, um, and so I feel really um, lucky about that because um, I just I I feel like I I want to know more about music all the time, but I just never find the time to do it. Um, and so yeah, most of it's coming from other collaborators. And, and, Um, yeah, I, I have a, I have a, I used to do a lot of work with other musicians live. Like that's a whole component I didn't talk about. But um, I worked with Bill Mace, who uh, was he's works with Kim Gordon, who's from Sonic Youth. Um, I worked with Jake McGinsky, um, who actually works with Bill Mace. So there's like this whole um, kind of other side of, of my work that deals with like improvisational work with musicians and trying to find. You know, certain vocabularies over time, with um, different histories over time, and, and in the realm of like the Penny Campbell um, stuff, but but more structured. Yeah, so um, that definitely is a factor in how I find things and, and the ideas that I have around the song. Well, that Yeah. Um, for me, I am really interested in finding forms and, and practicing them. Um, not in that you know exactly what you're doing all the time, but, but finding the right forms that have the right balance of structure and freedom that will let you be in the moment, but have enough structure where you're not like, oh, anything is possible, and then we're not able to kind of follow. So um, in terms of the class, um, you know, I deal with a lot of like how do you prepare the solo body, how do you deal with the rest, and then how do you how do you take all the information that you have in your own body and work with other people and start building um, structures. And so everybody, when I teach this, is collaboratively working to offer a score that they're kind of fine tuning over the course of the term, and then we practice that. And see what happens. Hey, as artist academic, yeah. what is what would you boil down to the essence of what you want to share as a teacher? Yeah. Um, I am interested in form and, and less about ideas first in a creative process. And so for me, I'm just in the kind of same lineage as Trisha Brown. Like, I love the vastness of the physical body in terms of articulation possibilities. And so I want to get students to kind of understand that you're not, you're not um, cornered into a certain aesthetic, even if that's your history. Like you can always keep expanding and thinking um, more expansively about what the body can do, and that anything can be um, possible in terms of structure, in terms of movement. Structure. Thank you. Thank you.